I've got a lot of great memories of the Hope Conference in New York City, but one of the absolute highlights and one that kept happening over the years was catching up with the Cheshire Catalyst. And with the news of his passing, I thought I would spend a little time about why I consider him the perfect hacker. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Perhaps not surprisingly, the greatest memory I have of the Cheshire Catalyst is his smile. If you've never seen a picture of him, well, assuming you saw him in the 2000s and onward, he was a white-haired gentleman with very thick glasses, a wonderful beard, a really intense tan, and a never-ending smile. He had the energy of a person half his age, and at the Hope Conferences I would go to, which would last between three or four days, he was always on. Here was a guy who felt not just like he'd always been here, but that he was enjoying every new minute. One thing about hackers, they get cynical. They get cynical very fast. They see how the world works. They experience the underside or they find the shortcuts, the shortcomings, and they internalize them. They push them into everything they see. They assume everybody is just out to do things fast, cheap, with no emotion, and they buy into that. And it makes them, frankly, somewhat unenjoyable to deal with as the years go on. There's a lot of bitter old hackers I don't go out of my way to interact with. But Cheshire... Cheshire had his own magic. So he graduated from high school in the 1960s, and if you have his name, which is either Richard Osband, John Osband, Ozzy Osband, or simply Cheshire Catalyst, you can find him popping up everywhere. Perhaps his most prominent position in earlier hacker history is that in the 1970s and 1980s, he was associated with the Technological Assistance Program, or TAP magazine, where he became the last editor. Now, I don't want to litigate this too hard, but he was the editor that took over after this institution, this wonderful hacker newsletter. It was kind of on the outs. And he had to shut it down and take on a lot of angry people. And he represents the last captain of a sinking ship. But within a very short time after Tapp's passing, started 2600 Magazine, with Emmanuel Goldstein putting together a truly professional-looking and now long-lived newsletter and magazine that I've contributed to, which many, many people have read or read something from, and which itself has become an institution that even eclipses what TAP was. All the issues of TAP, or at least a good majority of them, are on the Internet Archive. It was also known as the Youth International Party Line before separating away on politics and becoming more technological, Although technology is politics, which 2600 knew from day one, Cheshire oversaw the ending of TAP, and he could have just walked away. I know many of the people from that era, they would move into professional jobs or mostly stay out of everything that was in any way hackerish in favor of their careers, of their names, and wouldn't really get involved after some period. Due to timing, I missed the first few Hackers on Planet Earth conferences, the HOPE conferences that 2600 started putting on at the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York City. So by the time I started attending, 
it was well underway with its own sort of moors and traditions and staff who were working it. And in that period, when I first started going, that's where I actually met Cheshire Catalyst. Again, here was somebody who had been involved with hacking and various bits of social engineering for decades before I saw him. And if I could tell you that the youthfulness, the smile, just that incredible energy he had was sitting there when I met him, blew me away, made me feel like I was growing cynical in my 30s and I needed to step it up. Ozzy was involved in a bunch of projects, but his number one most favorite story was finding out that his local area in Florida was going to split its area codes. Ozzy, you see, loved rockets and space. I don't mean a little bit. I mean his high school photo is him posing in an actual spacesuit with his name on it. This was a guy who loved rockets, who moved to Florida and was at every launch, enough that he became known as a fixture in these places, calling things out in parking lots for people to know when to look, and generally having himself completely in the center of every one of these launches. This was a love of his life, and as a result, he looked at what area codes were both eligible to be used and available within the numbering system, and he fixated on 321. He wanted this area where there were constant launches of rockets to have the 321 area code. He lobbied local governments, he created editorials, and with the help of others and making his pitch effectively, 321 became the area code. And did he stop there? No. He immediately registered the phone number 321 blast off which was his phone number for the rest of his life. That sense of fun, of doing things, getting involved, meeting people face to face, and yet in your own way being a trickster, that was Ozzy. I interviewed him for the BBS documentary, and I have the full tape up, and in that tape he sits down in his interview and launches into an absolutely perfect definition of hacking. He does it with no prompting. As soon as he knows that my camera is rolling, he launches into a perfectly rehearsed couple of sentences about what hacking is. And he explained to me after the interview that he had long ago learned that when news crews and media were around, it was best to grab the camera, give your prepared speech, and editors working on a very, very short budget of time and money would be able to just grab it and move on. And this would guarantee you'd be a part of the project. That's Ozzy. That's the savviness I love. He worked himself to the bone for Hope Conferences. This was a guy who did not settle for sleeping. And there was another part of him that I kind of inferred over the years, even though my direct knowledge is a little bit scant. Ozzy did not have a lot of money. He clearly lived on Social Security. He definitely had to pass the hat to get by, and trips were definitely limited for him, especially in the later years of his life when I was talking to him, when I really knew him. This means several things to me. First of all, Ozzy never sold out. We never saw Ozzy selling Cheshire Catalyst branded items or trying to convince kids to pay for stickers or pay for t-shirts or build up some sort of media image with the idea of people investing in him as a brand, as a product, as a figure. The other is that when he did things, it's clear to me he did them because he had to, because his heart was there. He would travel from Florida to New York on a budget that was very limited because he loved 2600 and that hacking conference so much. 
Imagine that amount of limited resource, and yet you still, still can't stay away. There's hours of Ozzy on Hope conferences, speaking on panels, being part of events. He was involved in a hacker-themed talent show I helped MC. And there are so many conversations I was gifted enough to have with him over the various hopes I attended. Hope only happens once every two years, so I don't have a long, unbroken string. I never knew what Ozzy would be like the next time I would see him. And I never knew when the next time was going to never come. Well, now it has. One of the last things I ever did with Ozzy was have him ask me for a few bucks to get lunch. Breaking out that beautiful smile of his and just asking, hey man, could I just have a few bucks? Just want to pick up a little lunch here. Now, I don't know what your feelings are about that, but the idea of somebody living so close to the bone, still having such a love for this thing, and who had inspired me directly or indirectly for so many decades, just asking out loud for a little bit of support when he needed it the most. I gave him a hundred dollars, and I told him this wasn't a loan. This was a thank you. That was among the last things I ever said to him. I never talked to him during his downtime. I never talked to him or interacted with him outside of these conferences. Sure, he could probably have been a whole different person, but when I see the news come out where people talk about the guy they called the space hobo and how they were now mourning him, and as all these groups come forward talking about their facet of this diamond of a man and how it affected them in positive ways, well, all I know is I have lost somebody who I truly, in many different ways, loved very deeply. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Dileep Reddy, Sean Kelly, Trixie the Cat, Martin, Sembiance, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. I am so glad that there is so much footage of Cheshire Catalyst, of him speaking on stage, of the interview I did with him, of the times he appeared on podcasts or over the phone and it was recorded. His memory, his trail of joy that he leaves behind him, that's why I save Hacker History. If this is truly the first time you've ever heard of Cheshire Catalyst, I think you're going to enjoy finding out about him.